Well, welcome everyone. God bless you. Thank you so very much for taking time to view this very important teaching that deals with how to function in your priestly role. Each and every one of us, as we were born again, instantly became priests. The Bible tells us that we are the priest of the Most High God, that we are royal priest at that. And he said that he also have made us kings and priests together with him, or priests and kings, actually. Priests always perceive the kingship. And so Jesus functioned as a priest while being on the earth and now will return as king. And so when we understand this, priestly role, when we come to the place that we really understand that each believer in the body of Christ has already received their position, and the position is that of being a priest. And so I am so grateful to God to, that he gave me such insight back in 2008 that I began to now instruct the body of Christ on how to function in their priestly role. And for years, we were telling people that they were royal priests, peculiar people, holy nation. Um, they were called to God to be these priests, but we were never telling them how to function in the priestly role. We would tell them they are something, but they didn't know how to now function in that place. Well, the place of the priesthood is, as we clearly know, and the bottom line of that is to stand in the gap place for um, a generation. But is that all? And um, there is so much more to understanding this place of the priesthood. When you start looking at this um, critically and just go through the scripture, um, it is an amazing thing that you find over in Isaiah. Why don't we go there really quick before we even get into the slides. I have a few slides for you tonight. So if you go to Isaiah 61 um, in your Bibles, the Bible says the spirit of the Lord is talking of Jesus here. The spirit of the Lord is upon me and that me is Jesus is not Isaiah. Um, because we know that Jesus took this, this passage of scripture and um, read it in the synagogue. And he said it was speaking of himself. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel or preach good tithings, gospel, same thing, unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He has to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. As, as, as Jesus is functioning in his priesthood, notice he's anointed to preach good tidings to the meek. Those are teachable people. The meek has to do with being teachable. Um, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, those that are brokenhearted. The priest has the responsibility of dealing with brokenheartedness to proclaim liberty to folk that have been bound. The captives, if they're captives, they are not free. And so freedom and liberty is now proclaimed to them. And now they can walk free and get out from under the captivity that has, that has held them. And the opening of the, the prisons to them that are bound, my Lord. And he says, and Jesus then right there, shut the book, close the book. If he did not go to verse two, it was not time for him to deal with verse two, but to let's, but we're going to read it. And verse two says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Okay. And now <clears throat> verse three now changes the focal point from Jesus to um, actually to the body of Christ and to us. So he says to appoint unto them, now, not me, but to point unto them, what? Um, that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, 
that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that God might be glorified, that he may be glorified. And that's an awesome stuff that you're now going to receive the garment of praise for this spirit of heaviness that could come upon us, and you will be called trees of righteousness. Now watch as we go through this. It says, verse 4 of Isaiah 61, verse 4, and they shall build the oasis. Look at this. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolation of many generations. Look at this. You will restore, you will build old waste places. You will restore these places. You will repair waste cities. This Now, who's doing all this? Let's see who's doing all this. Verse 5 continues the, the, the functionality uh, of them that he spoke to. He says, because he would, he would what? He would anoint them. And so now verse 5 com continues that. He says, and strangers shall stand and feed your flock, and the sons of the aliens shall uh, be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Now we come to who he's talking about in verse six. He says, but ye shall be called the priest of the Lord. So all of this work, and let me finish, <laughs> men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall be, ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. And for your shame, you shall have the double and for your confusion, you shall rejoice in their in their portion. Therefore, in the land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be upon them. Now, we came back to all the way to them. So who are they called? They're named the priest of the Lord, the ministers of their God. And so that's who's building these old waste places, um, um, raising up the former desolations, preparing um, and repairing the waste cities. Um, and and the desolation of generations. That is the job of the priest. You see, it's one thing to say, okay, you're standing in the gap place, and this is, is a great thing to do, and we will talk about that. You're standing in the gap place, but again, is that all? No, it's not all. You have the ability as priest to be the restorer of path to dwell in. You have the ability to change the things that have been wrong into things that are right. You are those people as priests of the Most High God. So now you've got to now function as priests. One of the things that I've said over and over and over to um, the body of Christ as I've talked to them about this, this one major point is, is that um, the priests go to God. That's our job. We go to God for people who cannot get to God themselves. Now we've got we got to clearly now go back to the place to understand that everybody can't get in the presence of God. That is has to be clear to us because we've been we've been telling people who cannot get into the presence of God to pray. And we said you need to pray about it. You need to ask God to help you. Well, how are they going to do that? when God doesn't acknowledge them. When you say God doesn't acknowledge them, what, what you mean, uh, Bishop Jackson? Well, we know that, um, again, sin and, 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 that, and lifestyle of sin cannot come in the presence of God because of his holiness. And so he turns himself away from them so that he doesn't have to judge them and giving them chance to repent. The prayer of repentance is heard in heaven and God receives that prayer of repentance. And at that point, they have access. They have access. But the priests of the Lord, those of us who have already accepted God, we are his priests who stand between him and these people who can't get to him. And we make intercession for them. We are the ones who now um, say to the Father, Father, would you do this and do that for these? That's our position. When someone tells you about their issue who they and, and they are not saved, then you have now been given an assignment. Your assignment is to take that to the Father. Now, once they can see that the hand of God has already moved for them, wow, 
Now what can they do? They can now go on their own <laughs> because all they have to do is repent to go on their own. And now you don't need me anymore. You see, the truth of the matter is none of us as believers need to pray for each other, yet it is a great thing to do. So don't, 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 don't misunderstand me. We ought to pray for each other and the increase of each other's lives and the protection of each other's lives. But the truth of the matter is, if I was on a deserted island by myself and no one knew that I was there or <laughs> you didn't know where I was, I don't need you necessarily to pray for me. I can get to God on my own. Why? I have access. I have access. The priestly ministry gives us access to get to God. Okay. And so when you understand that, man, it is amazing when you understand that you are these priests to stand the gap place. So let me show you something here. Let's, let's, let's um, add my slides in here. <clears throat> I'm going to keep the, the slides on the side. So it's not going to be a big problem. I I'm going to do that so that my screen isn't taken over, um, but you'll be able to see everything. Um, and you can see the next slides is not a problem. We're not trying to hide anything from you. We're trying to make sure that you know um, what is going on. Okay. So when you understand this, that um, we are priests of the Lord, then Aaron had a breastplate. You see it on his chest right there. Aaron's breastplate was positioned on his breast and he had two onyx stones on his shoulders. But these breasts, this breastplate had each of the tribes. All 12 tribes of Israel is represented by the 12 stones on his breastplate. As he is there before God, as he goes in before God into the holy plate, excuse me, he is actually in actuality taking the entire nation with him into that place. Aaron becomes that intercessor between God and the nation because no one else could come into this place. So when you think about this, Aaron's high priest, he served the nation as the intercessor who carried the nation in his heart before God and on his shoulders, because on his shoulders, the two onyx stones that's on his shoulders, they each had six of the tribes engraved on their uh, names, engraved um, on, on, on each of the uh, onyx stones. And those onyx stones are very important for us and our breastplate prayer mentality and our finality that we're using it, okay? We'll talk about that later much later, but he was the representative from God to the nation. So now, not only is he representing the nation to God, he's also coming from God, representing God to the nation. And um, and so if they needed to hear from God, they heard from God through Aaron. Everything he wore was designed to keep the nation focused on the Lord and all of the Lord's greatness. And so everything that he has on from the mitre, from the matter of fact, over his head, the mitre on his head is holy unto the Lord. All of this is in is is designed um, by God so that they would keep their focus on Him through Aaron. Now we've got the ephod, we've got the breastplate, we've got the robe, we've got the patch, the breeches, we've got everything. We, we've got <laughs> all these all these different parts now. In a broader sense, we could go through all of that. I'm, I have many times. I will not go through all of that with you at this point because it is really not necessary for us at this point to go to where we need to go right now. One to also understand that the Levites were positioned around now. You know, the Levite, the Levites are the, the Levitical tribe that Aaron is a part of and Moses is a part of. And this Levitical tribe is now called by God into the place that they will now function as priests. But they are positioned around the tabernacle. This, the, the, the whole tabernacle is here and uh, with the tent of meetings and all of this. And, Aaron, and the whole tribe, all of the tribes are three on each side of the tabernacle. On each side, there are three tribes. Now, in front of those tribes, though, are the priests. In front of the tribes, the priests are positioned, okay? 
and Aaron and his son is sons. They're in front of the gate, which is the east of the tabernacle. We will deal with all of this um, um, in 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 more detail soon. But just think about this: the tabernacle ushered in the Levitical priesthood before the tabernacle was set up, and all of that. The Levitical priesthood was not needed. But now the Levitical priesthood is now there to serve under Aaron and his sons to now minister for and unto the people because you cannot get to God. No other tribe, no other leader in any tribe could get to um, 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 God. They could only get to God through the priest. And that is the Levitical order. Now, let's look at that for a moment. In Numbers chapter 3, Verse five is the Lord spake unto Moses saying, bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron, the priest, that they may minister unto him and they shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation to do the service of the tabernacle. And they kept and they shall um, keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation and the charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. And they shall um, give the Levites and Aaron and to his sons. Um, they are wholly given unto him out of the children of Israel. Okay. Now, this is awesome. So each of these um, 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 men in the tribe of Levite Levi are now brought into the priestly order. Now, it's really interesting because Levi had three sons, and these are the three sons, Gershon, Koeth, and Moriah. Now, these three sons were the delineation and the divisions of priests um, that would serve under Aaron, the under the three sons. And so the priests were separated into the three different divisions, okay? Now, each of their names are interesting. Gershon means exile, Koheth means assembly, <clears throat> Mariah means bitter, okay? So each of these sons are the sons of, of Levi. You can find that in Genesis 46 and 11. And so you can find that out. Now, what's interesting, um, ladies and gentlemen, is that these sons all had different responsibility. Each of them had different responsibility. Um, and the, Ger the Gershonites carried the curtains, the hangings, the coverings, which they carried during the journeys. Each of them, that's what they did. Their whole job was to do that. They could do nothing else. They could do nothing else. They could not decide to do something else. They had to do what was assigned to them. Very important. The Kohites carried the holy vessels. So all of the holy vessels, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of shoe bread, the, all of the holy vessels, anything that was holy unto the Lord, the, the seven branch candlestick, the menorah, all of that was carried by the Kohites. The Gershonites could never carry <laughs> the holy vessels. It was not permitted. Okay. Um, the Mariahs were responsible for solid framework and the, of the building, the pillars with the sockets and the silver and the brass and all that is basically found in the outer court to build up everything and the tent of meetings. All they carried all those kind of things. So that is here. Here is really interesting that you have all of this separation, um, yet one priesthood. This. The priest is serving unto God, but here are their responsibility. God has said, you're going to do it this way. Now, so listen, look at this slide here. The Levitical service were not interchangeable, okay? Their services were not interchangeable, but, but, uh, but no one could perform them except the priest. So their, their services were not interchangeable, but the services that they were performing only could be done by priests. So Reuben, the tribe of Reuben could never decide to go in and help the priests in any way. 
Simeon's tribe, Judah's tribe, no tribe, no, none of the tribes of the 12 could come and help the priest. Only the priest could do this. So we found this out. David found it out as well. We find this out in 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and 25. So David the, the el, um, and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obadiah with joy. Now, Obadiah, you know, that you remember the story that David, uh, that, that the Ark of the Covenant was lost under Saul, who never went to try to recover it. But David found out that the Ark of the Covenant was at Obadiah's house. And because they remember the Philistines uh, wanted to get rid of the Ark of the Covenant because it was um, destroying their gods and causing them to have sicknesses and boils and those kinds of things. And as a result of that, the Philistines said, we got to get this Ark out of our, out of our nation, out of our land, because their God is angry. And so that the ark is placed in Obadiah's house. Obadiah's house is being tremendously blessed because the ark of the Lord is at his house. Man, the presence of God, the ark of the Lord deals with the presence of God and the throne of God. And here God is blessing Obadiah. He is getting blessed going and coming. Okay. And that speaks to us. If we could get the presence of God in our house, come on, somebody. Come on, and then the blessings of the Lord will follow. Well, Obadiah is there enjoying all that the ark is providing for him. But David says, look, we got to go get the ark. So David, as king, pursues the ark, and he goes to get the ark. And when he goes to get the ark, he, he makes a mistake. Um, and, well, verse 26 says, and it came to pass when God... Um, help the Levites that bear the ark of, of the covenant of the Lord, and they offer seven bullocks and seven rams. And so what was interesting when David first went to get the ark, you can remember this, and again, I'm not trying to um, go through all of this, but you this, this fits so perfectly that he went to get the ark from Obadiah's house. He placed the ark on a new cart. He was put it, he put it on a cart, and if you remember, um, the cart as they were bringing the um, Ark of the Covenant out um, and, and it was on the cart, the cart shook like it was going to fall over and um, Yuza, um put his hand out and touched the Ark and died instantly on the spot. He died instantly on the spot because he touched the holy vessel. David then at that point was baffled. He said, how can we bring the ark back into um, Jerusalem? And so David had to do some research. And when he researched, he realized only people that could handle this ark were the Levites. But which Levites? You see, not any Levites, not all Levites, only the Kohites. So what is not said in that verse is that, and it came to pass when God helped the Levites who are the Kohites that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams and, and all the way into Jerusalem, they um, offered um, um, rams and lambs before the Lord, okay? But it was the Kohites that, were, that was carrying it. So this was not an interchangeable thing. It could not be done that way. Now, what I want you to understand is that this ironic priesthood and this Levitical order is very important for the time that it was at hand. Very important. Now, what I can also tell you is that around that tabernacle, as we, we looked at, and the reason why I didn't want to move my slides because I wanted to go back and forth, such as this. Now, remember, I said that they were positioned, the tribes were positioned around the tabernacle. Now, there were three tribes on each side. Each of the tribes, each of the tribes on the side of, had a front tribe, and they were in order. 
they were not just scattered around. They were in order around the tabernacle. Okay. So you have, you, you have, um, uh, Gad on the, on, on the North, you have Reuben on the South, you have, um, Ephraim on the West and you have Judah on the East. Now, why I'm just saying those four, because if they are the front tribes, being the front tribes, that is the side, that side of the tabernacle or that side of, of, of the, of the tent of the, of the tent of meetings is represented by that tribe. So if you're going to go to the Reuben side, okay, there are other tribes behind Reuben, but it is identified by Reuben. Okay. And when they would lead out in marching, Reuben tribe is in front. Also, um, Reuben tribe is a tribe that have the standard. Now, each one of them have a standard, but uh, Reuben's tribe is a tribe that is out front with the standard. What's the standard? The standard is a flag. Okay. The Bible says that uh, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Now, see, for 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 years and years, I had no idea that that was a flag, that God will lift up his flag against <laughs> him. And um, what flag is he now lifting? And we know now it is the flag of the tribe of Judah. And so they were positioned there. Now, the way they position based on the number of people in these tribes that are positioned behind each other, the, the I could show you a whole nother slide and maybe we will um, in, 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 in another week or so. What, we, what I need you to understand is that this tribe formation looked like a cross. When you, when Aaron would go up on the Mount of Sinai and look back down into the valley, he would see a cross. Now, what you've got to understand is there was no such thing as a cross at that time. There was no cross um, at that time to understand uh, anything about. So, <laughs> so God is foretelling, even in the formation of the tribes around the tabernacle, of what is about to happen. What's about to happen is there is going to be a new emphasis, a new priesthood, and it will be centered on the cross. The entire priesthood will be centered on the cross. It's interesting, too, that the tribe, the, the three tribes, Ephraim, Manassas, and Benjamin, those three tribes that are on the west, they were, they their population was the least, so that the cross and and the population uh, behind Judah um, was the most. And the two on um, Reuben and Gad's side were basically equal. <laughs> so when you looked at it, it was a perfect symmetrical cross. <laughs> it's amazing. Perfectly symmetrical based on the population of the, the, the people the number of people in their tribes. Now, what I want you to get to, my time is flying, is this. I want you to understand this. And when you get this, we can, we're going to stop here, but we've just gotten started. Believe me. Um, the priesthood changed, but the approach remained the same. What I want you to understand is that God changed the priesthood from the ironic Levitical order because of the cross, okay? And we will look at this even further. Because of the cross, it has been changed. But the approach to God remained the same. So, <laughs> so <laughs> this statement means that we must understand how the cross fits with the priesthood. When we understand how the cross fits with the priesthood, now we can approach God in the way that God wants to be approached, okay? So let me read something to you out of Hebrews and we will be finished for this session. Hebrews 7, 7 and 1. For this Melchizedek, watch this, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, 
who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descendant, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a what? Priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, who unto whom all, uh, even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth part. Now watch this, ladies and gentlemen. It is saying here that Jesus is a priest and was made a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I don't know about you, but I want you to think for a moment with me. Here is the son of God, and he was made a priest. The question that we must ask, why was Jesus made a priest? Why was Jesus made a priest? Here is your answer. Because only priests can come before God. Only priests can come before God. No other person have the access to God except priests. Therefore, you've been made a royal priest. You are a chosen generation. You are a peculiar people. You are a holy nation. To show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Just as Jesus was made a priest, you've been made a priest also. And when we come back, we will deal with why were you made a priest? God bless you. Have a great one. Bye-bye.